Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan, and today I want to talk about the Grand Army of the Republic. This is a military force that is entirely made up of clones of one individual, Jango Fett. One would assume that with their standardized upbringing, training, weapons, armor, and tactics, that each individual clone trooper unit would be exactly the same. But that couldn't be further from the truth, of course, as the war went on, the experiences these clones went through along with who was leading them would drastically change the spirit of each unit and even their physical appearance. Shortly after the Battle of Geonosis, the plain white ultraviolet paint that adorned all Phase 1 clone troopers would be covered with a wide variety of decorations, colors, and modifications, as each clone unit began to develop their own unique unit history and culture. By the last year of the Clone Wars, every veteran clone stood out from one another. They styled and dyed their hair in various fashions, tattooed their bodies and faces, and the most individualistic amongst them became ARC troopers. Ultimately, no matter how hard the Kaminoans tried to make the clones robotic and predictable, human nature and the genetics of Jango Fett won out. Today, we're going to be taking a look at the 10 most unique clone trooper units within the Grand Army of the Republic. But before we get there, a quick word from our sponsor for today's video, Raid Shadow Legends. And here to help us out is Death Knight, a champion from the game who arguably has failed to reach full potential as a combatant. And so now, he pretends to be a teacher of sorts. Professor Death Knight here from Teleria University, who legally not a school, with a math problem. If you create a hit mobile game in 2019, how many champions will you have now? Over 700! Not only does Raid have hundreds of rad champions, it also has 15 amazing factions. Faction Pop Quiz, can you name the latest faction? If you said the elusive Sylvan Watchers, you're right! Okay class, any questions? That's a lot of new champions for you to compete against, Death Knight. Are you nervous? Nervous? Who said anything about being nervous? It certainly wasn't me. Oh, it was you? Yes, I'm nervous. What if they introduce some guy named Mega Death Knight? Ugh. I think you and Ultimate Death Knight are enough Death Knights for now. Plus, Raid has also added a pretty nasty boss for all of you guys to fight Akamori the Phantom Shogun. Defeat him and you'll get the Accessory Ascension, which allows you to upgrade your gear to new heights. And if you guys want to learn more about the lore in this universe, check out the new animated short Raid, Call of the Arbiter, on Raid Shadow Legends' YouTube channel. That's it for today, class. Your homework is to download Raid. Just kidding, I know you've already done that, so no homework! If you guys haven't checked out Raid Shadow Legends yet, we have an amazing offer for Generation Tech fans, including a lot of new bonuses, including the epic champion Drake. Just check out the link in the description below to get access to these bonuses, or hit that QR code for more information. Thank you for your patience, on to the rest of the video. Although inhabited water worlds were quite rare in the Star Wars galaxy, Kevin Costner, the Grand Army of the Republic still fielded a special unit of clones that trained for underwater combat. They were known as the Clone Scuba Troopers, and they were outfitted with a special armor that allowed them to breathe underwater for an extended period of time. They also wore flippers and had six propulsion jets on their armor to give them a bit more mobility. Instead of normal blasters, the Scuba Troopers used the specialized DC-12U beam rifle. This dual-barreled weapon was completely sealed and fired low output blaster bolts that could be focused with a special type of lens for effective use underwater. Clone scuba troopers could also utilize OMS Devilfish mini subs for a bit more firepower and mobility. You know, I like to think of these things as more aftermarket modifications. Compared to the species native to the oceans, a clone scuba trooper was still at a big disadvantage. There's also the fact that when fighting underwater, one has to deal with a much more three-dimensional battlefield, sort of like what happens when clone troopers have to fight in vacuum. Overall, being a scuba trooper was incredibly difficult and dangerous, but most of these specialized units on this list are going to share that same trait. When the Republic entered the Mon Cala Civil War on the side of the Mon Calamari, the scuba troopers were led into combat by Kit Fisto, and despite their training and equipment, were easily overwhelmed by Corrin and Separatist Aquadroids. Arguably, the Gungans, a water species, performed just as well as the scuba troopers, even though they were unarmored and used primitive weapons. You can bolt on as many fancy attachments to a human being, but at the end of the day, we're much more comfortable on land. Death to the Dolphins.
Dressed in bright orange, the Clone Orden Specialists aren't necessarily equipped for frontline work. That honor falls to the Clone Combat Engineer, which is deployed with regular clone units. The Clone Ordinance's armor is a reminder that if you see them, there most likely are either massive caches of undetonated explosives in the area, or even worse, some type of radioactive, chemical, or bioweapon nearby that needs to be diffused. Equipped with Phase 1 clone armor, which is known to be a bit more sealed than Phase 2 armor, the clone bomb troopers were lightly equipped with weapons, but carried a wide variety of tools and sensors to help them detect and, of course, defuse bombs. During the release of the Blue Shadow Virus on Naboo, the Clone Ordnance Specialists arrived immediately after the regular clone infantry cleared the facility. They would quickly try to defuse all the bombs in the facility, but they were a bit too slow, and one of the Scepter's droids actually detonates the bomb, spreading the Blue Shadow Virus everywhere, and yes, they get infected. It is just a part of their job. Like I said, a lot of these units have uh, very dangerous jobs. In my opinion, the 104th Battalion should be, you know, spoken about in the same way that people speak about the 212th Attack Battalion and the 501st Battalion. Sure, they get less coverage, but they were one of the earliest clone legions to be deployed in the Clone Wars. That means they were heavily outgunned and they basically were involved in a crazy amount of battles. As the 501st and the 212th were taking part of the famous Battle of Ryloth, the 104th were taking part in the lesser-known Battle of Abrigado. More people know this as the encounter between General Plo Koon's fleet and the Separatist superweapon, the Malevolence. During the battle, the men of the 104th Battalion suffered the infantry soldier's biggest nightmare, and as being trapped on a ship while it's being destroyed from the outside, where they could do very little to save themselves. The one concession of the Battle of Abrigado is that Plo Koon does manage to survive alongside a handful of clones. The 104th Battalion would be reconstituted with new clones, and the unit would change their color from maroon to gray, perhaps a sign that this new unit was in constant mourning for what happened to their predecessors. This new battalion would be nicknamed the Wolf Pack Battalion. Apparently, it's Dave Filoni's favorite battalion because he's really into wolves. The Wolf Battalion was very special in that it could carry out a bunch of different special missions that required very specialized troops. The Wolf Pack took part in the extraction during the Citadel Rescue and the mission on Kadavo as both Starfighter pilots and also jetpack troopers. They were also well trained at nighttime warfare and helped carry out a string of assaults on Grievous' outposts during the Second Battle of Volusia. They were also capable of operating in extreme environments like the deserts of Obadiah's Moon, famous for its sandstorms. This probably would have been a great place to hide Luke from Anakin now that I think about it. The 104th greatly outperformed their creator's expectations, and they're a great example of why the clone army was one of the finest fighting forces in galactic history. The 21st Nova Corps was part of the 4th Sector Army and designated as a reserve force. This meant that the 21st Nova Corps was relatively unscathed for the first few years of the war. They would only begin seeing heavy action in the last year of the war during the Outer Rim Siege. Which is probably a good thing because the 21st Nova Corps, also known as the Galactic Marines, spearheaded some of the toughest offensives in the Outer Rim Sieges. It should be noted that it'd be wrong for us to call these clones soldiers or even troopers because of their Marine legacy and love for crayon rations. As Marines, the 21st Corps had the highest standards of discipline, training, marksmanship, and discipline. They also wore specialized armor that allowed them to fight in very difficult terrain with very difficult atmospheres, or even no atmospheres. Although a true Marine usually doesn't require a helmet to fight in vacuum, and that is because their commanding officer usually doesn't allow them to die from suffocation. If Palpatine had his way, the entire clone army would have looked just like the Coruscant Guard, made up of what's known as the Clone Shock Troopers. It's an interesting name because Shock Troopers convey the image of heavily armed assault units designed to tackle enemy fortifications and defenses. But the only thing the Coruscant Guard seemed to assault were the Republic's principles. In this way, the Coruscant Guard were similar to the Stormatilung, a paramilitary group which carried out attacks against Hitler's political opponents. The Coruscant Guard at their core were supposed to be peacekeepers and replacements for the Senate Guard. We did an entire video about how Palpatine orchestrated this brilliant move and basically made sure that the seat of his political power, Coruscant, was secured by men only loyal to him. You see, these clones were different. Like every other clone trooper, the Coruscant Guard were born on Kamino, but they were actually raised in secret facilities on Coruscant and trained to be loyal only to Emperor Palpatine himself. The Coruscant Guard were extremely disciplined, and unlike many other Jedi-trained units, which had individuals defecting from their ranks during the rise of the New Order, the Coruscant Guard more or less stayed firm.
More popularly known as the Bad Batch, Clone Force 99 was structured like your average Clone Commando unit, which already is quite special if you ask me. Clone Commandos are generally inserted behind enemy lines in small teams of four, and while they usually did rely a lot on stealth, they would eventually make contact with the enemy and they would be forced to fight their way out all by themselves, usually with limited support. What made Clone Force 99 stand out from your average Clone Commando unit was the fact that the four original clones that made up this unit were all given experimental mutations when they were born. This gave them physical advantages on the battlefield. You had the Marksman, Crosshair, who had extraordinary reflexes and terrific eyesight. He once shot a tank shell while it was still inside of an AAT's barrel, ready to fire. His use of tiny reflector mirrors, which allow a single shot to take out multiple opponents, is also uninspiring. Their Slicer Tech had genius level IQ and was extremely quick at processing information. That meant artillery solutions, hyperspace coordinates. He also once won a riot race because of his analysis of the racetrack. Their heavy wrecker was much larger than your average clone and at the same time possessed superhuman strength. He once wrestled a baby Rancor into submission and on another occasion he lifted a crashed LAAT off of Commander Cody. And then you had Hunter, who was a terrific tracker and perhaps more importantly always led the Bad Batch towards doing what was right instead of what was easy. Without him, Clone Force 99 probably would have lost their way a very long time ago. Now, because of their mutations and, you know, how different they were from the rest of the clone army, they didn't always fit in. Sometimes they even had problems with the normal clone troopers, which they like to call regs. It's not surprising that most of Clone Force 99 would defect from the Empire Falling Order 66. They would be joined by the unaltered clone Omega and also former 501st Legion clone trooper Echo. Like Nova Corps, the Elite 41st Corps was made up of over 36,000 clone troopers who were divided into 16 individual regiments. The 41st is basically the ideal version of what a corps should be within the Grand Army of the Republic. It was a fully equipped and fully staffed unit and usually led by high-ranking Jedi Masters like Luminar and Dooley or even Master Yoda himself. The 41st had an entire regiment of Rangers and Scouts giving this unit many options and flexibility to deal with the enemy. The 41st would be sent on a wide range of missions. You had smaller ones like when Green Company was tasked with escorting Trade Federation War Colonel New Gunray to Coruscant to stand trial or taking part in grand campaigns like the Second Battle of Geonosis or the defense of Kaishik. The 212th Attack Battalion is probably famous because of its commander, Obi-Wan Kenobi. But as an attack-oriented unit, a part of the 7th Sky Corps, it was also equipped for rapid engagement of enemy forces using a variety of airborne and stealth infantry assets. It took part in many major Republic offensives, including the Battle of Christophus, the Battle of Teth, the liberation of Ryloth, the second invasion of Geonosis, the Battle of Umbara, and the list goes on and on. Because of the exemplary leadership of individuals like Obi-Wan Kenobi and Commander Cody, the 212th Attack Battalion was able to survive multiple battles without taking heavy casualties. It's a feat that should be applauded, especially when you consider how many frontal assaults this unit had to take on. The 212th Attack Battalion performed way above their weight class and delivered many crucial victories that determined the course of the war, including the Battle of Utapa, where Obi-Wan Kenobi defeats General Grievous, the last CIS leader to pose a threat to the Republic. The 501st Legion is the most well-known clone unit to the fandom, and this is partly thanks to its leader, General Anakin Skywalker and Captain Rex. Several arcs of the Clone Wars TV show even featured individual troopers from the unit like Fives and Echo, and followed them from their time as cadets to their first battle to when they got promoted to the rank of ARC Trooper. For many fans, Episode 2 was when they first saw the Clone Troopers, but it was the 501st who really expanded our understanding of what the Clone Troopers had to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. We witnessed their highs and lows, the unrelenting and unconditional love these brothers had for one another, their competency and bravery under fire and perhaps the most important lesson of them all was just how vulnerable these innocent men were to bad commanders and politicians who sought to use them for their own personal gain. The 501st helped humanize the clones to millions of Star Wars fans. And for the prequel generation, this was kind of George Lucas's gift to us. He put a lot of life lessons into the Clone Wars and he used the 501st Legion as kind of a vessel for all of those lessons. 
We learned about the horrors and futility of war. We learned about the dangers of conformity, the meaning of courage, and perhaps most importantly, that when all things go to hell, when there are, seems to be no other options left, that it's important to look to your brothers, to look to your family, to your friends for inspiration, and of course security.